a term. Um, you know, with someone like, uh, and I, I now have a, a website that I decided to dedicate specifically to this, uh, let's say, a constellation, not, not a movement, it's called alternativeright.com. Uh, when someone like Marionetti, you know, wrote a manifesto or something, I think he kind of created a movement um, with that manifesto. I didn't do anything like that. I think I was trying to put a name on something uh, that was that's already developing. It's a, a constellation of writers and thinkers. Uh, the alternative right is by no means a mass movement. Uh, it sadly uh, uh, is uh, not one possessing uh, think tank money and, uh, uh, and, and big foundation uh, donors and, and all of that kind of stuff. It's basically a, uh, a constellation of a lot of different thinkers uh, who have gone completely AWOL from the duopoly of conservative and republican uh, uh, politics in America. They've gone AWOL from the kind of lesser of two evils, whom are we going to support this year, uh, politics. And I, I think on a deeper level, uh, they, the alternative right questions the real fundamental egalitarian and democratic assumptions of both the left and the right, both the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States. Um, Alain de Benoit, uh, who's a, um, a member of the, the so-called, you know, Nouvelle Droite, uh, the New Right in, in France, he, he once uh, addressed the French Communist Party, and he said that really left and right are no longer operative. What's operative is the center and the, the outliers, the center being egalitarianism, being democracy, being mass consumerism, so on, globalism, so on and so forth. Uh, and people kind of being on the outside. Uh, another one of my uh, friends and, and someone who's contributed to, uh, to the website, Jim Kalb, uh, he said, you know, what, what the alternative right is, is really is thinking the unthinkable, thinking something that's dangerous. And uh, uh, I, I think that's a, a very good definition. It's also worth pointing out that um, if you think about other, uh, let's say, deviations from the political norm in American history, uh, they very often agreed on fundamentals with, uh, with the party from whom they were, they were deviating from. If you think of uh, Robert Taft or someone like that, questioning the Cold War, questioning the Korean War, things like that. He basically agreed um, with the Republican Party, you know, conservatism on, on, on the big issues. Uh, we don't. Uh, and, I, and again, I, I think that's a, that's a very important thing. Uh, if I were to describe um, the alternative right in, in one way, I could um, list a number of people and, and, and websites and publications. Certainly, uh, many of them are here you know, today. I would certainly uh, uh, talk about Peter Bremelo and, and, and V. Dare and uh, Paul Gottfried as our, our, our theorist. Uh, also, I would, uh, there's another thing that I'll stress, and I'm going to return to this a little bit later in the talk, but there's a whole blogosphere that's developed around uh, Steve Saylor, and, uh, and basically something that I think now is being called HBD, which is Human Biodiversity. It, it, it was formerly called uh, Sociobiology, and it also is related to what might be called Race Realism. Um, and in some ways related to white nationalism, if you think of uh, Jira Taylor and people like that. But there's a whole blogosphere focused around HBD. Uh, and this is, again, something that is um, without question taboo uh, in the mainstream uh, of both left and right. And I, I think it's something that, uh, uh, that, it, that is certainly a kind of you know, engine drive the alternative right and something that, that separates us from, uh, from pretty much everyone else. And there's also uh, the other aspect, which is a... Um, some you know, very crucial insights from Austrian economics. Um, and I'm going to particularly stress a, a certain kind of uh, apocalypseism uh, uh, later in the talk of, um, of what that means for us. Um, I'll really, before I begin, I'll, I'll just quickly lay out um, uh, some groundwork, although maybe I don't need to do that. I, I think um, uh, Hans is very good at talking about the, the paleoconservative movement as kind of a, uh, uh, as a rear guard, hastily assembled action against neoconservative ascendancy within the, uh, within the conservative movement at GOP. Um, you also have something that uh, is certainly also that, influenced, uh, that influences uh, us, uh, if you think of the old right. Um, but in some ways, that, that, that's a bit of a myth. The old right is a... Uh, 
uh, you know, consist of a uh, great literary stylist and, and philosophers like H.L. Mencken or Albert J. Nock, Garrett Garrett, Rose Wilder Lane, maybe even Ayn Rand. Uh, but this is something that was in some ways, it, it was invented by Murray Rothbard um, uh, after the fact. Uh, it, it was, uh, it, it, most of these people did not know one another. They certainly were not working in any kind of movement. And so to say that that was betrayed or uh, to talk about, you know, with Justin Raimondo um, wrote a book under Rothbard's uh, guidance about the lost legacy of the conservative movement. To call the old right a lost legacy of the conservative movement, I, I think is uh, a, a bit wishful thinking. Uh, not to say that any of those people aren't great and influential, but, um, uh, you know, but again, that, that's, uh, you know, to, to think of us continuing the old right or something like that, I, I, don't, I don't think that's... Uh, uh, that's possible. There's also the, the French New Right, which I, of course, uh, mentioned. Um, and there's also something that I'm going to dwell on um, today, which is the American conservative movement and what's a kind of Buckley-eyed movement. Um, I think also what is important with that is that uh, people, contemporary conservatives, are either kind of completely unaware of something like the old right, the French new right, or even the paleos, or else they totally reject them uh, as somehow anti-American or anti-Semitic or, or, or racist or evil or left-wing or, or something like that. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, that's fairly important. Uh, there is a, a very strong hegemony in, uh, in, in the American discourse on, on, on both sides that is simply not going to recognize, in some ways, these, these other divergences and things that are, um, that are much more uh, intellectually stimulating, in, in my opinion. Um, let me talk uh, a little bit about uh, conservatism uh, in general, and, uh, and, and also I'm going to um, talk about a, a certain kind of problematic uh, relation that, um, or a problem, problematic um, position that the American conservative movement and the Buckley Ad movement has taken. And I think that's actually very good at, at really getting to where this new alternative right is diverging um, from the mainstream conservative movement. Um, conservatism, uh, perhaps despite its pretensions, is a scandalously relativist mode of thought. A conservative conserves something. And he's thus inseparable from the social order and the class, usually a ruling class, that he has chosen to defend. Uh, Karl Mannheim, the uh, Hungarian Jewish social scientist, um, discussed the fact that conservatism really lacks uh, a priori, and it's, but it's, uh, it has great abundance of hick und nunc, uh, perhaps also ad hoc. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a form of thought where you are really defending a specific social order in a class. Uh, so thus, Edmund Burke is without question a conservative, uh, but then so is uh, Brezhnev, uh, is also a very conservative thinker. He, was a, uh, he consolidated an empire. The, uh, the 1991 hardliners who uh, attempted a coup uh, in Moscow were, were deeply conservative people. They were trying, they were kind of a last gasp of, uh, of a particular version of the Russian Empire. Um, and so what I think, in some ways, these, these conservatism was always relying on a certain revolution. And in some ways, um, the, way, the way I would think about this is that there's, with conservative thought, there's a, there's a kind of cancellation effect, um, where in some ways, uh, cause sometimes, uh, um, uh, or sometimes the effect precedes cause. Uh, they kind of have things backwards. And, um, you know, one, one joke that I, uh, I, uh, I, or one, you know, anecdote that I, I like is from a, um, a movie called uh, To Be or Not To Be, which was a, uh, it's a 1940 comedy. It's, it's very, very good. It's kind of an improbable comedy about a, uh, a uh, husband and wife acting team in a Polish theater troupe in occupied Warsaw. And um, uh, the, as the joke goes, the, um, the, the husband comes back, he sees his wife, and he says, oh, I just got back from the poster maker, and I just insisted that uh, your name get top billing above mine in our next production. And, uh, and she said, oh, you know, you know, you deserve it, darling. And, you know, she says, oh, well, that's, that's so wonderful, I, I appreciate that, but you, you really needn't 
do that. Uh, it, it's simply not necessary. And he goes, oh, I knew you were going to say that, and that's why I told the poster maker to put my name back on top. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that kind of psychological cancellation where um, some previous revolution, some previous social deviation has kind of reimagined it's conservative is, uh, is an essential characteristic of conservative thought. Um, and so, you know, if we, if we look at what, uh, you know, who are the conservatives today, you know, in some ways you could probably say the, uh, the liberal establishment is a deeply conservative. I mean, David Frum, uh, David Broder, the Washington Post, all, you know, Keith Olbermann, various, various, you know, big name liberals are really deeply conservative people. They, they are, they are consolidating and fighting against uh, people who are going to upset their order. Uh, they, they love moderates. Moderates are beloved, conservative moderates particularly are beloved figures. And, uh, you know, and if, you, if you really question anything about the welfare warfare state, you must be kind of delusional or, or, or perhaps evil and racist, or you should be you know, maybe jailed or locked up. Uh, I, I, you know, I think that that is basically the the, the mode of thought, and I think that's a that's a very deeply uh, um, deeply conservative. Also, the but of course we do have conservatives in America, and I think in some ways their function um, is uh, what Murray Rothbard um, described them as uh, in, in the 1992 uh, John Randolph Club speech, which uh, which Hans has alluded to. He says a genuine conservative. Uh, the kind the liberal establishment loves, doesn't want to repeal or abolish anything. He is a kind and gentle soul who wants to conserve what left liberals have accomplished. And thus, you know, while my, my friend Paul Godfrey might rage at the conservative movement for its constant outreach to, to various minorities, for its, its discovery that Martin Luther King was actually a conservative theologian, uh, for its uh, support of not only the New Deal, next thing they support LBJ and the welfare state. Um, uh, you know, someone like Paul might, might be outraged by that, but in some ways it is, the conservative movement is serving its function uh, when it does like that. It's that constant kind of cancellation, if you think about it in a Hegelian sense, of the past and the kind of sliding forward. Um, real quickly, there of course was, uh, there is another conservative movement um, and, uh, oh, well, maybe before I say that, I'll mention, well, I'll just skip, skip over that. Th there is a, another conservative movement, and, um, and that's something in America that is actually, uh, it's, it's one that's very flexible, and, um, it, you know, it's a, it's a kind of grassroots conservative movement that you can trace back from, say, immigration restriction in the 20s. You could probably connect it with prohibition. Uh, you could connect it with the American First Movement. You could connect it with various grassroots populist appeals. You could even connect it with the Scopes uh, so-called monkey trial. You can connect it with basically populist appeals to the heartland, um, this notion that uh, one, one, one needs to be a, a kind of a dignified religious person in order for this constitutional to, uh, democratic uh, capitalist system to work, and, and various kind of grassroots popular appeals. I think in some ways left and right is a very visceral thing. It might very well be a, a genetic thing. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and certainly supporting America in the Cold War and, and elsewhere was just something that one did as a, as a kind of a, you know, upstanding uh, a person. Uh, this, this, this kind of, uh, this in many ways wasp, in many ways a kind of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, a group that was the, the grassroots of, of conservatism. Uh, they are a, a very uh, unpredictable bunch. I think someone like Sam Francis, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s, he believed that these middle American radicals would, might very well kind of go and take their country back. Um, and he wanted to appeal to them. This is a kind of a dangerous appeal. I, I think there was a, a, a Mars revolution, as he said, but uh, it, it sadly occurred in 2002, 2003, and they were eating freedom fries and, uh, and supporting uh, George Bush's war uh, in, in Iraq and elsewhere. So this is a, you know, this, this kind of grassroots populist, uh, white Christian, uh, you know, kind of thing. It's, it's not led by intellectuals, and it's, it, it can be turned in various directions. Certainly, it's, it's very excited by the Tea Parties. It's also very excited by Sarah Palin uh, and things like that. What I think is interesting about the conservative movement, um, and this is the, the Buckleyite one, the one, one by intellectuals, um, is